Yeah, I, you know, first of all, I think we've been fortunate that every defensive coordinator I had has, has been a top 10 defense. So that that's a ton of credit to them. That's also, I think, the system and the organization we run as a whole. Um, but I think with Tom, I think for, for a lot of us, uh, a lot of what the head coaching position has become is not necessarily why we got into the profession in the first place. And Tom is able to get back to doing what he loves and what we all love, which is coaching ball, um, coming up with scheme and spending as much time as you possibly can with the players and the staff. And, you know, I think that's for him as, as well for a lot of us is probably a breath of fresh air to get back to doing those things. And now all the, the head coach stuff, uh, he doesn't have to deal with anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a pretty unusual uh, situation. You know, I wouldn't describe that similar as the situation with Tom. That that was pretty unusual, but I think that's I think pretty telling about you know where college football is at and how the job has changed and how a lot of those factors uh, can be outside of your control. And I don't know all the details of that. I don't know all the you know, uh, perspectives on that, but that one is a, a sitting head coach in the conference that, that leaves to go be a coordinator, feeling like professionally that was a better decision and a better job. James, have you had any roster changes in the last month or so since the transfer portal window closed? Yeah, I think we had the, the Carlin kid, which I think you guys have seen. James, you mentioned that you feel like Julian has a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Um, how does that kind? Of, how, does, how do you pick that up? What is he doing? What is he acting at? How do you kind of sense that that chip is there? Well, I, first of all, I think the chip was there right, right from the beginning when when we you know, we started looking into him uh, once he entered the transfer portal. You know, the, the chip was there. Uh, you look at whether it's Rucci or himself, guys that were highly, highly recruited young men you know, out of the state of Pennsylvania um, that had really high expectations. And you know, whether it's his percept perception or whether it's outside perception, uh, that he's got a lot more to give the game and, and, a, and a program. So um, he did a really good job of getting on campus and just getting to work and, and building that kind of trust and respect from his teammates. And then it's gotten more vocal here recently, but I think he's just in a good place. I think, you know, you look at those two guys specifically, I just think they're in a good place emotionally, mentally, physically. You know, you look at, you look at Rucci, and you know, one of the big issues that he had before coming to Penn State, he's had a hard time putting weight on. I mean, six foot eight, so you can be 300 pounds, six foot eight, you look skinny. Um, and he's like 320 pounds right now, and it's a, I don't know if there is a thing, but he's a skinny 320 pounder. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's possible. But he really is at six foot eight. Um, but you know, you know, Julian, I think really had that chip from the time you know we started talking to him, and obviously wants to be able to do big things for Penn State, but also for himself. James, one of the changes you made in the offseason was bringing Jordan as director of life skills, Jordan Hill. Was that a position you always wanted to fill, or were you waiting for the right person? And, and Jordan was that person. Yeah, it, was, it was more about Jordan. Um, Jordan's a guy, obviously, great Penn State player, but as I got to know him, he's just, as you know, he's just a great human being. Um, and he's really a great example of what Penn State's all about. Had a great experience while he was at Penn State and went on and had a great career in the NFL and then got back into the game. You know, I think there's a ton of former players that would like 
to get back into the game. But for myself and probably a lot of coaches, you'd like for them to go do it somewhere first. Penn, State, Penn State's not necessarily a first job. You look at Dan Connor, he was coaching at multiple places. Alan Zemitis was coaching at multiple places. And um, you know Jordan had been coaching for a number of years. And um, you know I was just so impressed with him when I got to know him. Uh, that it was they when we had an opportunity to bring him back home and get him a part of our program because I think he's a guy that will relate very well with our our players uh, and can be you know the reality is when you when you play in the NFL and you're a former Penn State player you automatically have credibility and we had an opportunity to get him in the building and and Pat and Vinny were supportive and we made it work. His, his job description though, can you talk about like what you expect out of Jordan when you say director of life skills as far as Yeah, I'm not going to get into all of that stuff, but okay. mainly he's got a chance to be a mentor to our players. Um, you know, mainly mainly off the field, academically, socially, those types of things, make sure they're maximizing the Penn State experience. You know, under the new rule changes, you know, Pat Kraft's going to be coaching the linebackers and, and Jordan's going to be coaching the D tackles and uh, Vinny's probably going to be coaching baseball. But like, um, you just have a lot more flexibility than you've ever had before. But ultimately, he was brought to be a mentor off the field you know, to our guys. So what, what's the idea behind the coaching you guys do every year? How important was it this year, given that you have a so uh, when I was at the Green Bay Packers, we did a retreat, a coaching retreat, and I thought it was really good. Um, we went to a resort in Wisconsin, Kohler, you know, the faucets and stuff. They got a great resort. We went there, and I just sat there as a young assistant and said, you know, it's a really good idea. I've never been a part of this before. If I ever become a head coach, this is one of the things that I'm going to do. Mike Sherman was the head coach. Um, so as soon as I became a head coach, we started to do it. We did it when I was at, at, at Vanderbilt um, in Nashville. Um, there's a video of myself and Brent Pry and a bunch of guys jumping off a cliff because we always do football uh, from 8 to 12, and then we go out and do something, golf or something in the afternoon from a chemistry standpoint and getting to know each other. Everybody's got a different roommate, somebody that you normally wouldn't be with. So there's a lot of reasons why we do it, but it's been really valuable. And then the other thing is we work around the state. We do it in Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, different places to get some contacts and connections there as well. Uh, but your point, you know, we always have turnover. Obviously this year with some coordinators, it was important. Coaches don't want to spend time talking philosophy. They want to scheme X's and O's. Um, but it's important everybody understands culturally who we are and why we do things a certain way. So that's what a lot of it's about, about structurally how we do things, why we do it that way. So now they can put that to bed and, and focus on you know, football specific scheme, techniques, fundamentals. Um, but if you don't do that, in my opinion, over two to three years, you get turnover, 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 and then all of a sudden, you got a bunch of people in the building that don't understand your culture and how you operate and how you do things. Yeah, I think number one, uh, you're a first year starter in the Big Ten. I think the best defensive. Um, league in, in all of college football um, but I think when you're year two just year two whether it's year two as a head coach experience matters year two as a quarterback in major college football and specifically the Big Ten matters so it allows him to spend the whole offseason and say okay these, these are the things I did well I want to build on them these are the things that I want to do better I miss this throw why let me work on that throw all summer I miss this check in you know the run game or in protections or whatever it may be. Let me let me kind of you know spend enough time on that that I can clean those things up and learn from them. Uh, it's making plays for him at the running back position and the tight end position at wide receiver. And now with a new coordinator, it's it's how can we put him in the best position to be successful and also explosive, which was our biggest challenge last year offensively. James, you mentioned. You mentioned over the offseason the importance of getting your best offensive players involved. Andy said last month that 
Bo is one of your best offensive players. So how have you already seen Bo benefit from being in Andy's scheme, and how do you expect him to continue to benefit from it? Well, I think, first of all, that was another area that was an issue, right? You look at the last two games of the year, that, that changed dramatically. Um, explosive plays changed dramatically, and touches for guys changed. So um, that's something that I think is football 101, but a lot of times, you know, mistakes are made there uh, for whatever reason. So um, that's a focus that me and Andy spent a lot of time talking about uh, in the off season. And then I think, you know, Andy's done enough things as an offensive coordinator over 19 years that he's able to play to the strengths of his personnel. If you're looking specifically to Kansas, uh, Bo's probably more similar to the guys that he had at Kansas. I remember talking very early with Drew about that, you know, and I said, you're talking about a guy who's been offensive coordinator for 19 years and has done it with a lot of different people uh, and a lot of different skill sets uh, and also is does enough things offensively that we're going to be able to play to whoever the strengths are of the guys that are on the field. So uh, he'll have a role. He needs to have a role. He had a role last year. Um, uh, you know, he's come still competing for the job as well. Uh, but he's going to need to be a part of what we do uh, either way, however this camp plays out. I'm more than happy to talk about the guys in our current program. You want to talk about the guys in our current program? Yeah, I'm just saying, who, who you got? No, we, we love the guys in our wide receiver room, excited about what they're going to do. Obviously, we added Julian Fleming from the transfer portal, who's a Pennsylvania guy, and doing great. I want to talk about our program, our guys. Um, I got nothing but respect and love for the guys that have been of our program in the past, but that's not what the Big Ten media days is for, is to talk about other programs and other players, in my opinion. James, we know that you guys would have been one of the biggest beneficiaries of these expanded playoffs that have been seen. Do you feel like that changes the expectation for you guys at all? Or what do you, in your head, what do you think is a, would constitute a successful season? How do you try to it? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, obviously, a lot of people have kind of made that statement and talked about that statistic or that data, and, and that's great. Uh, for us, it's what do we do to put Penn State this year in the best position to make the playoffs, but then not just make the playoffs, put ourselves in an advantageous position in the playoffs? How do we put ourselves in a position to have an opening week by? Um, it's amazing. I've seen so many things about um, Notre Dame not having a buy as part of their um, requirements with the playoff. They do have a buy. They don't have a conference championship game. That, that's their buy. Um, how do we get ourselves in a position to have a buy? Uh, if not a buy, how do we put ourselves in the best position to have a home game in Beaver Stadium, which which would be an advantageous position uh, with those elements at that time of the year. So that's our focus. How do we get into the playoffs? And then not only that, how do we put ourselves in the most advantageous position so we can make a run and a run that could be up to 17 games? I think one of the interesting things that is a challenge uh, with the college football playoff model is in some ways, um, if you play in the Big Ten championship game and you lose the Big Ten championship games game, that is a more challenging situation than not playing in the playoffs, excuse me, not playing in the championship game and making the playoffs. And I don't know if that is ideal, but the reality is the conferences are making too much money from the conference championship game and they're not going to give them up. But that's one of the things that's a, a little bit of a, uh, a challenge and a curveball um, for the way the system is currently set up. Jay, you mentioned the whole potential for a whole playoff game. I know this is very sort of out there, but what's the possibility that you can pull a sort of spur of the moment whiteout for a Pacific game? It may be a whiteout, and we had nothing to do with it being a whiteout. It may be a weather whiteout. Um, you know, I, I will say this. Something that me and Pat really haven't talked about up to this point, but um, we, we feel very strongly that there should be one whiteout a year. 
we're able to create some really cool environments with a stripe out, um, a helmet stripe, which is very close to a white out. We're able to create some really good environments to throw back game. I think it's up for discussion um, with myself, Pat, and others to say, hey, we only do one white out a year, but if we would have a home playoff game, is that something to discuss? That, you know, uh, this is a different model in college football and we want to do everything we possibly can to put us in the best position to be successful. And if that gives us a little bit extra juice and between Pat Craft and Mother Nature, we may have one of the biggest whiteouts we've ever had. Yeah, he's competing for a jo starting job right now. He is happy and healthy. They got a very strong relationship with, with both his mom and dad. Both are, are Penn State alums. Um, both are, are former athletes at Penn State. And, and it's been very clear to me that Nolan is thriving right now. When you talk to our strength coaches, he's thriving. When you talk to his parents, he's thriving. Um, and I thought he did enough this spring to give himself a ton of confidence and also give us a ton of confidence as coaching staff that, that he's got a chance to, to play for us and play at a high level, allow us to win games in the Big Ten. I don't think it's as significant as people think. I think the whole the whole reason that this got changed is the whole sign stealing deal. I think that was a big reason why this rule got changed, and it doesn't really help that. I think a lot of people that passed the rule think it did. If you're running a no huddle offense and you can talk to the quarterback, how do you get the information to the wideouts that are 53 yards apart from each other? You're still going to have to signal. So um, there may be more people that huddle than have in the past to avoid people stealing signs, but it doesn't really resolve that. Uh, for us, either way, uh, we're happy with it. Uh, there are some challenges that you have on special teams because you can only have one guy on the field at once with it. And on special teams, you got a blend of people on the field. Uh, and you could have some changes throughout the game where you end up with two players on the field at the same time. So you got to be strategic about that. You got to be you know, careful. Um, but I think it's a good rule change. I'm glad it happened. But I think the whole reason the rule got changed is because of the sign stealing whole discussion. And I don't really feel like that resolves that whatsoever. No, I, I think that's a really good question. I do think that you have to be careful with too many cooks in the kitchen. You know, I think the NFL is a really good example of that. Typically in the NFL, you got the head coach is the quarterback's coach, the offense coordinator is the quarterback's coach, and the quarterback coach is the quarterback coach. And in some ways in the NFL, he's almost like a GA, um, you know, for the quarterback position. So I do think you have to be strategic about it. You got to be smart. We talked about this the last few days about um, make sure everybody in the room understands we're going to maximize our personnel, but don't just think because the rule changes that you're coaching because you have to prove that you're ready for that. Um, but but Pat will coach um, the linebackers that don't play. We'll let we'll let Pat coach those guys. Uh, Dan Connor will, and Tom Allen will coach the ones that do. Um, but but honestly, like we're going to maximize it as much as we possibly can. Uh, and the rules allow you to have some flexibility. They really do. Um, so we're going to look at that. But I think your point is a good one. You know, we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the horsepower that we have and the manpower that we have. Uh, but make sure that we don't have too many voices in too many rooms. And when there are different voices, ultimately we better all be speaking the same language and singing the same song and singing at the same tune. Yeah, I, I already answered that, but I'll, I'll answer it again. Um, so if you're, if you're running a no huddle offense and you're talking to the quarterback, how do the receivers that are 53 yards apart from each other get that information? So 
whether you're signaling from the sideline to get that call in or whether you're talking to the quarterback, the quarterback still got to get that information out to the receivers. So you got to choose to either not go no huddle or now have the quarterback get the information. But if you want to go fast, you still got to have to signal to the receivers from the coaches or now the quarterback signaling. But I think it's like anything else. It's the old, what is it, whisper down the line, that whole thing in class where you, you teach the class and you say something to you and you whisper. By the time it gets over here, it's a totally whisper down the line. It's a totally different story by the time it gets to the end. So I think as coaches, you're always trying to eliminate as many steps in the process as possible to eliminate mistakes or, or um, miscommunication. Is, what, what hat is that? That's the Bucky's, the convenience store. But I was going to say, the, the Wawa and Sheets people are going to be pissed. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, that, that's, that feels almost like... I'll hear about it now. Yeah, you should. That's why I'm bringing it up. Everybody get a picture of him and put it out on the, all the Penn State outlets. Pennsylvania outlets. Drew is limited a little bit. You're like, can I ask my question? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to ask a question. Drew was limited in spring. He could play a big role for you. Do you have an update on him? And also, Talk about Shelton. Drew Shelton, yeah. yeah. And also Jackson Smolin, who said he had a significant injury. Yep. Where is he at in the battle now for number three as far as health? Yeah, Drew is full go. Uh, he got cleared, you know, maybe about halfway through the summer for everything. Um, certain lifts he was being, you know, modified on. He's able to do all the contact and, and everything else. So he's, he's full go and has been full go long enough that we feel good about it. Uh, Smolik's going to be a little bit longer in this process uh, until he's full go. So uh, make it difficult for him during training camp to be competing for a job. But he's done a really good job mentally. Um, He's very far along in the process. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or, or not. This is the second time he's done that. So I think sometimes um, that's helpful is when these guys have had significant injuries, and that's kind of what I mean in terms of injuries. He's had significant injuries before. The guys that are going through it the first time, they struggle because they've never been through it before. He's been through a significant injury before, and I think it's really helped him in his approach and his maturity uh, about how to handle it. James, uh, what kind of opportunity in, in that vein is available for Ethan Grunkemeyer entering creases in camp if Jackson's not going to be available to be full go initially? Yeah, so so Grunk will be a part of that you know competition, and um, obviously when when one guy's not cleared yet to, to practice fully, he's going to get a lot more reps and a lot more opportunity. Where probably um, leading up to this. You know, Bo and Drew are in a competition, and probably Smolik and Grunk were in a competition. I mean, they're all ultimately competing for the starting job, but just based on experience and what they've done, that's probably how it would have played out. Um, and Grunk and and Smolik would have split those reps with Group Three, um, or now, you know, at least during training camp, you know, Grunk will get most of those. Coach, how do you feel today about uh, the hybrid role, so to speak? Yeah, I think a couple things. I think um, we feel good about it at defensive end, obviously with Abdul, you know, moving there. But after he got done spring ball, we sat down and had a conversation with him and his dad, and, and they're comfortable with, you know, moving back and forth. Uh, and the good thing is, I think that also helps us from a game planning perspective that people can't just say, we know Abdul's gonna be at this spot all game long. So I think that that's helpful. Um, the other thing is, all the way back to my time at Vanderbilt, we were essentially a 4-2-5 defense. Um, and you have the ability to do those things to maybe solve some depth issues you may have or just philosophically you want to put a different type of athlete and body type at that position also as you know uh, we feel really good about three safeties that we have and the amount of football they've played for us so that creates other ways to get those guys on the field so now rather than feeling like you got to provide depth at three linebackers you really got to provide depth at two linebackers 
knowing that you can split that depth of the third linebacker with a safety, with a corner if you want to play true nickel, uh, a big nickel like a safety like we just talked about, or like we've done for a number of years uh, with, a, with a true linebacker. We're one of the few teams left in college football. We're still playing with three linebackers. The funny thing is with Brent Pry coming from Vanderbilt, we never played three linebackers. We were, we were, we were two linebackers and, a, and what we called a star back then. Um, but coming to Penn State and it's LBU, you know, I think it's hard not to have you know, three of those true linebackers on the field and we embrace that. James, one, one of those safeties is uh, Jalen. Obviously, he's going into his fourth season, losing some leaders on the defense from last season. What did you see from him over this offseason, both as a safety and in that leadership role as well? Yeah, he's just been great. You know, he's played a ton of football for us. He kind of understands how we operate. He understands Penn State and the community. Uh, done really well academically. Him and Coach Poindexter got a tremendous relationship. Um, he's not the most verbal guy on a normal day-to-day -day basis. He's done a great job here today. Uh, super articulate, fun, showing a lot of personality. On a day-to-day -day basis, he's pretty quiet, but he's also one of these guys when he gets on the football field. Uh, he's got a great football IQ, and he's willing to speak up and be verbal. Uh, and we're going to need that from him this year, and he showed it all spring and all summer as well. James, you mentioned um, Abdul seemed an eye play a lot as well. I guess, where do you kind of stand with the depth there? And is Zariah for sure out for the season? No, no. I, I, I don't think I ever said that. You know, you have a tendency to do that. Like, you take something I, I, I say. I've been reported you, by about seven you, or eight outlets. I'm just saying, you take things I say, and then you say it back to me in a different way to try to get me to slip I, up and answer the I question. Was, I mean, but I, I think what I said was, was these guys have – I report it when they have long-term injuries, mm -hmm. I think is, is how it's been reported. Um, we expect to have Zariah, Jackson, these guys that you guys asked about, back at some point this season. And what about the depth of defensive range? Again, with like I think what was mentioned, like when Abdul moved there, it made us feel good about it. Coach, how do you kind of justify with the new guys coming in? You know, whether it's freshman transfers, how do you kind of justify the reps to say, okay, this guy can help us, or maybe this guy needs to redshirt and sit? Like, what are you looking for in terms of a guy playing versus me? Yeah, I think for, for us, it's interesting. Cause that's a question we get a lot from recruits and their families. Um, it's pretty simple. If you can help us beat West Virginia, you'll be on the field and you'll play. If you can't, you won't. You'll be on the bench. A lot of schools tell them what they want to hear. Um, oh, you're going to play as a true freshman. You have no idea. Guys get drafted in the first round. They've done a ton of research on and they end up, they end up being bust, right? So um, the recruiting process is one thing, and then you got to show up on campus and you're starting all over again. You got to earn it again, and you'll get what you earn. Some guys are physically ready to play, but they're not emotionally ready to play. Some guys are physically ready to play and they're emotionally ready to play, but they can't learn the playbook. They're not mentally ready to play. The playbook's very different from high school. So you gotta be physically ready, you gotta be mentally ready, you gotta be emotionally ready to play. James, I think we've mentioned all the other guys who are dealing with injuries in a public forum, but uh, Keon Wiley's the one that we didn't. Is he somebody that you expect to be back this season as well? Yeah, expect him to be back, same thing, long-term okay. injury, but we expect him to be back this season. Um, and excited about you know getting him back so you know some of the discussions we have too is like you know we're limited in who we can invite to camp so you know who do we invite to camp and not based on those types of things if you're, if you're getting a guy back you know by the third game of the season then you probably make make sense bringing him to camp if you're if you're, if you're having a guy that maybe he's not going to be ready till the sixth or seventh game of the season Maybe you wait and hold from bringing them to camp or bring somebody else in. Those are all the things that we're trying to decide. The challenges we all know is everybody heals different. Like some guys heal ahead of schedule. Some guys heal slower than schedule. Um, and you don't know that. Some guys really attack rehab and some guys struggle with that at first. That's like I'm talking about guys that have been through major injuries before. It kind of helps because they realize they can get through this and it's not the end of the world. Uh, so that's hard to predict. That, that's, that's hard to predict. But they are injuries um, that have been described as long-term, but we do expect to have back at some point this year. And again, when you're talking about a, a possible 17-game season, you know that, that could factor in for us. I think the other thing you guys recognize as well, there's the physical aspect of an injury, 
but there's also the mental aspect of the injury that they got to get through that as well and play as fast and as aggressive as they did beforehand. And that takes some time too. Does the issue that you think of the West Coast teams in the conference, does that change anything for you guys recruiting-wise? That's and a that polo shirt, isn't it? That is. Yeah. A lot going on. So oh, I was trying on. to find the polo <laughs> in there. Yeah, it's very nice. Exactly. Uh, can that what was your question? Getting started yeah. from the beginning. I lost it. Yeah, uh, so did I. In the, uh, the four West Coast teams in the conference. <laughs> your buddies team. like oh, think it's it. hilarious. Oh, out there was a big talk about him. Okay. okay. But can, they, can, can those four West Coast teams, can that change the recruiting operation for you guys? Can that open more doors in Los Angeles and the Pacific Northwest than, you know, two years ago, five years ago? Can that change things for you? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, we, we've had some West Coast team kids on the team already. Um, but I do think it opens it up when you sit here and say to yourself, if you're a kid on the West Coast, that, you know, we're going to have a number of games in our backyard. I think that's that's helpful. I mean, obviously, families have shown over years of college football that they'll travel and find a way to make it work. But I think this helps. Um, we have a little bit maybe of a challenge that others don't. I don't know if you guys have been to State College Pennsylvania before. It's not the easiest place to get into. It's not the easiest place to get out of. Uh, we've spent a ton of time and homework on this because, like, even when we play uh, USC and we go out there this year, you know, we got to drive an hour, 45 minutes to get to the airport in Harrisburg to get out there. We can't get a plane out of State College that will make it all the way to LA. So, all these things factor in. Um, and as a Northeast school, that that creates some some challenges. I think Rutgers has similar challenges, but I think they got bigger airport options that we don't have. So. That impacts games and travel, that impacts recruiting, that impacts a lot of things, and, and we gotta be strategic about how we approach those things. Is that the plan? Going back many years, although you guys have had a couple you know, that skirt with the same thing, but you guys have had a couple of guys that have had skirts with the same thing. What has it been like recruiting against them since typically the last year since the news? Yeah, that, that's a whole another conversation, um, um, but, but, a, but a good question and a fair one. Um, it's been good, you know, they, they've done a great job. Their staff has done a great job. Um, we all know what they've been able to do facility-wise. Um, obviously, the success that they've been able to have in that conference as well. Um, you know, they've really become a national brand in a short period of time for a lot of reasons. And a big part of that, obviously, is is the Nike logo and, and Phil Knight, uh, who, who I know very well and got a ton of respect for. So, um, you know, they're, they're a battle. You know, you know, we're in a situation where almost every guy that we recruit, uh, it's like those type of programs. It's, it's interesting whenever we hire a coach, I think a lot of times you hire a coach who maybe hasn't been at this level of program, they think, well, I'm just going to come to Penn State and I got the logo on my shirt and it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. You're just recruiting against different people now. You know, there's there's a different level of, of program you're recruiting against and that creates challenges. And Oregon is definitely one of those for a number of reasons um, that, that make them difficult to recruit against. James, is that indeed the plan? You guys will go to Harrisburg on Friday and fly out from USA? Is that what you guys have settled on or is it still? We're going out to Harrisburg, yes. So that date to be determined? To be announced. So maybe Thursday? So maybe I'm Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for extended stay out there. Maybe so, because so, if we go, you get yeah, to go? Yeah. Okay. Open practice uh, out there maybe? We, we will, but it doesn't make it an open practice. <laughs> I'm going out there. If you'd uh, like to do it, then we'd have to go. Thank you, thank you. Um, no, but we, we, will, um, we will go out early. Uh, and we will, we will go to Harrisburg. Uh, these are all the things, talking to all the different NFL organizations as well as college teams that they've traveled before. Uh, I think that's also the value of having somebody like Pat Kraft because these are things I don't know if people think about. You know, most schools have policies that tell you when you're able to travel for away games. So now when you add, you know, the West Coast teams that we've added, um, those things now are open for discussion. Like it, it's not the same old Big Ten. It's not the same old policies we have in a place. Everything needs to be looked at so that we can put our programs, let's just like they're probably having to do the same thing uh, to create a little bit more flexibility. I think it helps with football 
because we really only have five travel games for some of these sports. They're traveling all year long, whether it's baseball or basketball, like a ton of you know days of school they possibly miss. Football, it's five. Uh, so that creates a little bit of flexibility and helps. Um, but yeah, we will travel out from Harrisburg. That is correct. James, is Danny still a GA? And at what point do you have to find a different title for him, I guess would be the right word? Yeah, I don't think if we have to, the only thing that would, would would force us to change his title is you got a timeline. I think it's three years uh, to be a GA. And then there's also um, for starting a GA, I think it's a seven year after you graduate or stop playing in the NFL or professional football in general. Uh, they're really the only things that mandate um, or affect that. Um, and now with the new rules, I mean, literally, you know, you can do whatever you want and be strategic about what's going to be best, not only for coaching and rec but also recruiting, because uh, that's the only thing that you have a limitation on now is the 10 coaches that are able to go out on the road recruiting. So you could see some coaches, which I'm not going to get into that right now, but you could see some coaches being moved to analysts and some analysts becoming your 10th 10, 10 full-time coach so they can go out on the road recruit. James, I, I don't think we've had a chance to, to discuss your freshman wide receivers with you. Um, Peter and, and Dicey are getting to campus this summer. What are you looking from them as they get on the practice field? And then Josiah coming off an injury to end his high school career. How do you feel about what he's been able to accomplish thus far on campus? Yeah, as you guys know, I, I think we'll have another opportunity, another local opportunity once we get into camp. It's probably better for me to speak at that point. All the information I have now is just based on what the quarterbacks have said and, and what the strength staff has said and the little that I've been able to see. Um, but it's hard at this point. I do know Peter came in and tested really well. He's one of our bigger wide receivers. He jumped really well. He ran really well. He's like 205 pounds right now. He's a, he's a big physical athlete. Uh, and, then, and then I would say with Ty Sear, there's just been a real buzz about his demeanor and his approach and how competitive and how confident he is. Um, there's, there's a buzz in the program about him when you talk to guys, but you'll get to see a little bit of that when you guys come out to practice and I'll be able to talk more informed once, once I've seen it. I just haven't seen enough of it to, to speak intelligently about it with you guys. Can I just follow up on Josiah, though? I mean, has he, yeah, I'm sorry, has, yeah, I'm sorry. What's he been able to get done for himself here on campus? Yeah, I, I will say this. That it kind of goes back to my comment before. There's He's been physically cleared for a while, but this is his first major injury, so there's the mental aspect. And I know talking to him in the weight room the other day, he's finally at a point where he feels like – I ask guys all the time, like, what percentage would you say you are? And it's like 73%, like, Ooh, where the hell did you get, how do you go to 70%, like 70%, 80%, 85%, 90%, whatever. And the other day for the first time, he said, coach, I'm 100%. I'm like, like 100%? He goes, yeah, 100%. Like he feels good. So that's great going into camp. Uh, real talented guy, you know, it's a shame that his senior year got cut short really at the game I was at, it happened. So, um, so it's exciting having him back and seeing what he'll do. And it's great that he feels mentally and physically 100% going into camp. So that, that'll be, that's three young guys that we're pretty excited about. James, you mentioned uh, and alluded to some of the changes in coaching and head coaching, and some guys have re-examined that, that position for you. You're now in year 11 in, in Happy Valley. You know, how different is your job day to day? And, and you know how do you keep yourself fresh? Or maybe some of the ideas that you've championed that you're, you're glad to be. Yeah, 14 seeing. years now as a head coach, three in the SEC now and 11 in the Big Ten and specifically at Penn State. It is a very, very different job uh, than it was when I first started. Uh, very, very different. Um, but I think at the end of the day, whether it's the players and NIL or transfer portal and all these things, or whether it's the coaches and same thing, NIL, transfer portal, as well as coaches, you know, leaving, losing Brent Pry, going to be the head coach of Virginia Tech, losing Manny Diaz, going to be the head coach of Duke, all these different things. Um, I think it's really important for all of us to remember your why and why you got in it in the same place. There are certain times a year, certain periods that aren't a whole lot of fun and aren't necessarily what I signed up for. But at the end of the day, when I run out on that grass with these guys, 
and I watch them graduate and I watch their parents drop them off for their first day, you know, after signing with us out of high school and you look at the smiles and you look how proud they are and you watch them and you're flying around and having fun coaching the game and smelling the, the fresh cut grass. Um, that's, that's why I do it. And whether it was at East Stroudsburg in front of 3,000 uh, or Penn State in front of 107,000 and now in the Big Ten and going to be in the Coliseum, um, it's still the game of football and it's still special and I still appreciate it. What are your initial plans for the prospect of the three still 105 and it's not going to be scholarship. What does that do in recruiting plans to get to that point? Yeah, I don't think it's all going to be scholarships. I think that's up to every school to decide how they want to handle that. You have the ability to do that, obviously. They cannot limit scholarships anymore. That's why they're limit, limiting the roster size. Uh, and everybody will have a different way of doing that, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, all the things that are coming in college football. Um, you have the ability to keep your number small so that you're able to impact the, the guys that are on scholarship uh, as significantly as possible, or you can spread the wealth. Um, it's going to be more challenging for some programs than others. We've got programs in our conference that got 145 players on the team. So this is going to be a huge change for some programs culturally. I do think there is some, some flexibility um, in how you practice. Uh, in terms of your roster size, uh, it really, I think the 105 starts your first game. Uh, but during spring ball and summer camp, your numbers could be bigger than that. What's your opinion on recruiting calendar, especially in the recruiting calendar, especially the dead period? Say it again. The new recruiting calendar that changes some of the dates and things like that from the dead period and whatnot. Yeah, I, I think in, in general, I think most of them have been a good thing. Um, I really do. Um, I think their intentions were good. I think one of the problems you've heard people talking about a while, we got to stop kind of piecemealing it and do one big change uh, because you, you make these changes and they have unintended consequences. Um, you know, you, you're going to have this signing class that's going to happen and we're never going to home visit them. You know, like there, there's some gaps in this process with some of the changes and how things, how things happen. But I think in general, the idea of having a dead period at a time of year where most people are trying to get a little bit of off time with your family is po is positive. Um, you know, in the old days, you'd be on vacation, the number one defense tackle in the country calls and say, I'm going to be on campus tomorrow. Can you be there? You're flying back. So um, there, there's, I do think there's some value in, in the intentions of, of what we're trying to do, but we just, we need to do it more holistically rather than piecemeal. Good, leave it out of it. Yeah, leave it out of it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't I don't worry about that. I guess I guess for for me, I want to make sure that Penn State, whenever the rules change, we need to be as bold and aggressive as we possibly can under the new current rules. And that's really any industry. In any industry when the rules change, you better change with the rules and you better change quickly or you're gonna be left behind. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And I think that is challenging at, at some places across the country that take so much pride in the history and traditions and how things have always been done at places that have really tried to do it the right way. Some of these rule changes can be, can be even more challenging. Um, but that's, that's really us. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that anywhere where we can find an advantage, uh, we want to try to maximize that advantage. We want to be bold, aggressive in the decisions we make. Last one. I know you don't have to be on this video, but uh, when you were in a 
assistant at Maryland, Kurt Cicchetti was an assistant at NC State. You guys were both recruiting coordinators at the time as well. What a familiarity did you have with them at all during that time? Yeah, I don't know it based on how you described it. Um, my history is his dad was a legendary coach at IUP. And his dad offered me my first full-time position as the offense coordinator at IUP. I got offered the receiver's job at Maryland and took that instead. But uh, I had a ton of respect for his dad. IUP recruited me out of high school. His dad offered me my first full-time job. Well, that's not a necessarily true. Um, but basically offered me my first coordinator position. Um, and then I ended up having an opportunity to, to, to kind of go from there. But I knew of um, his dad and knew of his sons kind of through that more so than, than what you described about his time at NC State and my time at Maryland. That's how I know the Signetti family and got a ton of respect for his dad and, uh, and what the family's been able to do in terms of impacting the game of football. Thanks, guys. Thanks, James. Thanks, James.